you're going to Ecclesiastes in your Bibles. The book of Ecclesiastes. And we're going to be concluding our study of the book of Ecclesiastes today. A book that is focused on living wisely during our days here on this earth under the sun. Uh, days which can be challenging, which can be difficult. Uh, but it's an encouraging letter, not a discouraging letter. As Solomon, under the direction of the Spirit of God, has given instruction on how to live wisely through this world that is under the judgment of God, a world in which we experience difficulties and trials, what he calls dark days, painful days. But every day can have its own blessings, and we are to be sure to take advantage of those. We're going to put up, again, the foundational things for the book that we've looked at. Uh, the word translated vanity, we look at one more time. It's the word hebel, and here you have its basic meaning. The translators that put the word vanity, some put meaningless. Uh, there may be occasions where something that is but a breath is meaningless or empty worthless. But that's not true in the book of Ecclesiastes. You'll note its essential quality is lack of permanence rather than lack of worth. Um, it's something that is fleeting, transitory, ephemeral, uh, brief. And that's what life is on this earth and everything associated with it. It is but a passing breath. Um, so we keep that in mind. Uh, second expression that we used and uh, changed a little bit, striving after the wind. And I think a better translation is the wind's desire, the desire of the wind, the whim of the wind, um, something changing, unpredictable, out of our control. So life here is temporary and out of our control. So as you move through the book of Ecclesiastes, if you make those two corrections in uh, the translations that most of you use, it will help you appreciate more the book. Uh, we have looked through the main portion of the book, which comes down through chapter 12, verse 8, where he concluded, vanity of vanities, all is vanity, or with, I think, the better translation, breath of breaths, all is but a breath. Um, everything in this life and this life itself is but a breath. Um, some things that I noted that characterized the book just in a way of a summary before we look at his concluding remarks beginning with verse 9. First thing to keep in mind that we've been reminded uh, in Ecclesiastes is life goes by quickly. It is but a breath. Um, it's soon over. Secondly, we are encouraged. Live wisely. Start young. I mean, uh, the earlier you start walking with the Lord, and walking wisely day by day in obedience to him, the more joy and satisfaction you can experience in the life that you have here on earth. Work hard. Enjoy life. You know, the book of Ecclesiastes is about work. He started out asking about what the benefit of all the toil we have during our life on this earth. And you know, the world recognizes that. They live for retirement. And sometimes they ought to talk about the earlier you retire in. But God created us to be active, to work. And because of sin, work can become a burden, toilsome, tiresome. But in it all, God says, enjoy life. As we said, God didn't take all the joy out of life when he brought the judgment on sin 
on his creation. So throughout Ecclesiastes, he's not only encouraged a hard discipline work, but to enjoy your life. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Take advantage of every day. You know, our life is made up of the days. And Solomon emphasizes that. So we're reminded, this is a brief life. Every day is important. Take advantage of every day. You know, the week's gone by. You know, another seven days. They can't be regrouped, uh, recouped. They can't be relived. Um, They're gone. Uh, We either lived wisely and took advantage of each day or their opportunities that are gone, which is serious before the Lord, as we'll see in the section before us today. Lastly, make your brief life count. Uh, Make your brief life count. God has a purpose for us being here. He has a purpose for these days. He just didn't put us here so we could trust Christ and then just hang on by our fingertips, uh, hoping Christ comes today. We do hope he comes today. We're looking forward to the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to gather us into his presence. But you know what? He's put us here today for a purpose. This is a day that is to count. And every day we waste is a time out of our brief life for which we will give an account As we come to the last section of the book, like I say, he's connected verse 8 back to where he began in chapter 1, verse 2, with that expression, breath of breath, all is but a breath. Now he has some remarks in concluding uh, his main message. Now he'll summarize and remind us. And he's prepared us for this. Really, as we noted, chapter 11, verse 1, down through chapter 12, verse 8, sort of form the concluding overview of what he has written about in the book. And uh, as he moved along, he talked about how we live uh, in the first part of chapter 11. Then in verses 9 and 10, he encouraged us to take advantage of the days of youth. Um, Rejoice. During childhood, the days of youth, um, pursue the desires of your heart uh, in a proper way because God will bring us into judgment for what we do. But, you know, we don't have to be afraid to go forward. We don't have to, you know, God didn't create us to park, um, to just sit and wait. Um, We are to be active, so take advantage of the days of your life. Put aside the grief and anger and those things that would inhibit you enjoying life. Don't stew about yesterday and don't worry about tomorrow, as we've seen. Get on with your life. This is today. Yeah, but you know what happened to me yesterday? No, and nobody cares. My mother's favorite expression, nobody cares. Second favorite expression, nobody's listening. Uh, you know, it's true. Move on. Uh, why? The prime of life is fleeting. There's our word, hevel. It's a breath. You know, what he's saying is utilize every day and the days when you're the strongest, you're the healthiest, and you can do the most, they'll go by. And so he came into chapter 12 and reminded, remember, the, your creator in the days of youth, because the difficult days lie ahead. Because the wages of sin is death. And so, in the plan of God, these physical bodies will begin to wind down. And with that comes difficulty. Uh, less ability to do things that we could have done when we were younger, and so on. Uh, and those difficulties seem to pile up as we get older, and it culminates in death. And that's been a constant reminder, not to discourage, not to frustrate, but it's the reality of life. 
And it's a reminder to use each day because these days will pass. And the opportunities of today may not be there tomorrow. And what I could do today, I may not be able to do tomorrow. And as we get older, we're more reminded of that, and it becomes more evident. And he gave that clear presentation of our elderly years. And some of us are experiencing some of that already. And uh, some of us have more to look forward to. <laughs> um, but it's not bad. It's just life. Uh, it's negative in the one sense because life is important. A Christian, becoming a Christian, and now I don't have to think of death the way I thought of it as an unbeliever, but death, as I mentioned, is still an enemy. Don't want to forget that. Death is no friend. I don't like death. I haven't made friends with death. Um, I don't look forward to death. I wish there was no death. I wish the loved ones that I enjoyed fellowship with in past years were still here, but not in the deteriorated bodies they had. And that's where it comes, where the body winds down to soon we're ready. Um, even though we're not uh, looking forward to dying, you get to a point, and that's where he built. Uh, it's coming down into verse 6, verse 7. Verse 6 said, you know, there'll come a time when the things you used to be able to do, you could not do. And then when death comes, every opportunity is over. Now we're talking about life under the sun, this physical life. And that's obvious to us all if we stop and think. I can't relive last week, last month, last year. It's done. Those days are gone. And when I die, this body will no longer function in this life. We put it in the grave. You can embalm it surrounded with things uh, like the Egyptians did, but you know what? When they dig it up, it's still there, a little uglier. Uh, but it didn't do anything. It didn't use anything that was left with it. Why? It's done. That's his reminder. It ends up, verse 6, uses these four images to show usefulness is over. And life goes back to God. And the body goes back to the dust. So don't waste the days. In reality, you don't have many. It's brief. Then his statement of verse 8. Then we come to verse 9. And verse 9 and down through verse 14. Really, he wraps things up. And uh, he has two divisions in this. You don't maybe quite notice it in the English but in chapter 9, I mean in verse 9 of chapter 12, in addition to being, that's the same Hebrew word that starts verse 12 as well. But there it's translated beyond this. Uh, in addition, beyond this. So it shows there are two uh, basic divisions in these sections. In verses 9 to 11, he's going to talk about what God has said. The words of wisdom through Solomon. This is what God has said. And then in verses 12 to 14, he's going to emphasize the importance of listening to what God has said because God will bring us into judgment. Uh, so what will God do? He will judge us. We, so we emphasize what God has said and then he emphasizes what God will do. He has said words of wisdom to guide us in our conduct here. And we better pay attention. Because what will God do? He will bring us into judgment for everything we do on every day. So it elevates the importance of every day. We pick up with verse 9. In addition to being a wise man, the preacher also taught the people knowledge. And he pondered, searched out, and arranged many proverbs. I think Solomon is still the speaker here. 
Some commentators, many commentators, one writer said most commentators, think that this is an editor that now uh, has worked over the material in his speaking. I think Solomon is uh, speaking in the third person rather than the first person. He's not talking about what I did, but he's talking stepping outside for a rhetorical kind of emphasis. Um, it stresses that he uh, steps almost back and looks at what he has done and addresses it. Uh, in addition to being a wise man, and Solomon was a wise man. First Kings chapter 3, verse 12 tells us, God said he made him wiser than any man who lived before him or any man who lived after him. So he was unique for his wisdom. And we've talked about before, he had a breadth of wisdom. It just wasn't on, as we would say, spiritual things. But he knew all about plants and trees and all of those things. Um, he was the most knowledgeable and the most wise. That's come up through Ecclesiastes. Just come back to chapter 1. A couple of emphasis, because so many say this is an editor. I think it's Solomon, without doubt. Chapter 1, verse 13. And I, the writer, he's the preacher. I, the preacher, as he identified himself in verse 9 of chapter 12, the preacher, the one who assembled a group. So he's instructing this group that he's assembled. assembled. In chapter 1, verse 13, I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. So you see, this is Solomon. I'm the one, the preacher, the one who teaches the group. Um, I applied myself with wisdom. Look at everything done under the earth. And it did come up, this is, a, this is a grievous task God has given us. No, God has given us. This is not Solomon saying because I've been such a failure. No, this is what God gave us because of the fall, as we talked about. So his wisdom in chapter 2, verse 9. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. The wisdom God give, gave him wasn't a short term as far as just at the beginning of his life till he got things established, got the kingdom solidified and so on. No, it stayed with him throughout life. Um, so even as I had grown and I had assembled much and my wealth, I still had my wisdom. Down in verse 15. Then I said to myself, as is the fate of the fool, it will also befall me. Why then have I been extremely wise? In other words, wisdom has value in conducting yourself in life, but it can't take away the fact you're going to die. You're going to die like the most foolish, stupid person who ever lived. Your wisdom will not enable you to escape death, is what he would was saying, but he had his wisdom. Down in verse 19, who knows whether the man after me will be a wise man or a fool, and so on. And yet, all I've done to assemble with wisdom could be lost because the next person might be a fool. And his son, Rehoboam, was. And he divided the kingdom and lost 10 of the 12 tribes, and uh, so on. But Solomon is the man of wisdom. So when you come back to chapter 12, verse 9, in addition to being a wise man, the preacher, the one who called the people together to teach, also taught the people knowledge. So he just didn't get wisdom for wisdom's sake and all this knowledge. It was for the benefit of others. So I taught them knowledge, and that's what he's been doing in the book of Ecclesiastes. This is not the musing of an old, sour, frustrated man who's wasted uh, so much of his life. These are, these are words of wisdom. And he taught the people knowledge. We learned about God and his working and his will in Ecclesiastes. And note, he pondered, he searched out, and arranged many proverbs. Solomon was a diligent worker. He encouraged work. 
Uh, so even with his wisdom, wealth, and that, he wasn't parked. He was working. He pondered. He searched out. He arranged many proverbs. Um, it was work. He had the ability God had given him to grasp material and to sort it out and see how it fit and applied. Uh, so it took work, though. He pondered. He searched out. He arranged many Proverbs. Uh, in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 32, as we noted on a previous occasion, uh, we're told that he wrote 3,000 Proverbs. Uh, we've seen some of them in the book of Ecclesiastes. We have the book of Proverbs, which comes much from Solomon. And it's interesting to me. That same verse in 1 Kings tells us that he wrote 1,002 songs. And I think he might have rounded it off. 1,000 songs. But he didn't write 1,000 songs. He wrote 1,002 songs. We have the Song of Solomon. So he is a man who was diligent with the wisdom God had given him. Given him and an indication. We use the gifts and abilities God's given us. I can't be Solomon. And I won't give an account for the wisdom that Solomon had, but I will give an account for what God has given me and how I've conducted myself with what he's given me, as will each one of us. So we benefit. You know, I'm just reminded what Scripture has to say about Solomon. He records the failure of Solomon toward the end of his life and being led aside to false worship and that. And, you know, somehow the black spots stand out in our mind. But the Bible doesn't focus on the black spot. I mean, as we've noted in previous studies, Solomon is talked about in a positive way even after he's gone by God. And here we're told the things God used him to write. So much of the Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes, the book of Song of Solomon. Um, but sometimes we pick out the black spot and we miss. Uh, so uh, I think that's contributed to a misunderstanding of Proverbs. I mean, of Ecclesiastes. People have read into it, that black spot, and say, well, this must be what Solomon's going through because as little as well, that, he's a man used to write Scripture um, under the direction of God through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we are benefiting from it 3,000 years after his body has turned to dust in the grave. Verse 10, the preacher sought to, define, to find, note this, delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. You know, this is the one, Koholoth. We translate it to preacher, the one who assembled the group to teach them. That's his role. God gave him this wisdom and he searched out stuff. Now he's teaching it to others. These are delightful words. People think of Ecclesiastes as a down book, discouraging book. It's a real book about real life in a real world that's under the weight of God's judgment for sin. But it's a great place to be. Um, I'm thankful for today. I'm thankful for the life we have. Solomon says, I wrote delightful words. You know, having a delightful life is not closing yourself to reality, closing your eyes to reality. It's living a real life and taking advantage of the different things that come into life and realizing God has appointed the time, this day for me, and the events of this day for me. And it's a day the Lord has made, and I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. And even in the dark days where I'm hanging on by my fingertips, my God created this day for me and these events, and it's tough. And Lord, you know I'm just barely getting by. And I can say with Solomon, I wish I had never been born, but Lord, I have been, and here's the day for me. And this will be brief. And we move on. So these are delightful words. There, he wrote words of truth 
correctly. I mean, that's important. Solomon understood the solemn responsibility he had uh, to write delightful words, words that are helpful, words that will uh, help you and encourage you in your relationship with the living God and conducting your life wisely according to his will. They have to be recorded. They're words of truth because God is the God of truth. He cannot lie. Um, so these have been words of truth, and they're written correctly. Come back to Proverbs, since we're talking about other things. We've not gone a lot to other books, because you could uh, spend a lot of time in Proverbs when you're going through Ecclesiastes. But come to Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. And it chap talks out about wisdom calling and understanding, lifting up her voice. Here, you know, Connie, it's getting God's attention. Come, pay attention, listen. And he told us in chapter 1, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And like we go out and call people to Christ. Call people to the living God. To know Him. To trust Him. And now have your life conform to His will. Come down to verse um, 6. Listen, for I will speak noble things, and the opening of my lips will reveal right things, for my mouth will utter truth. Anything contrary to truth is an abomination. This is what's being recorded. That's what we have in Ecclesiastes. That's what we have in the Word of God. Um, Verse 8, all the utterances of my mouth are, right, are in righteousness. There is nothing crooked or perverted in them. Verse 10, take my instruction and not silver, and knowledge rather than choicest gold. For wisdom is better than jewels, and all desirable things cannot compare with her. This is the truth about God, the truth from God. It's the most precious that's what he's talking about. And I want you know, to mention, this is truth. Jesus prayed to his Father and said, Sanctum, thry them in the truth. Your word is truth. And this is the only truth of saving value. There's other truth. It doesn't tell you about how to do heart surgery or... You know, so many things. But anything related directly to God and His work, His will, His salvation is contained here. Everything we need for a life, for life and godliness is contained here. Now, somehow the church can drift. We come up with other ideas and they seem good. We need to be careful. You know, I, as a preacher, have no authority outside of here. You know, so don't put up with, well, we'll go to this verse and I'll give you then my 10 best ideas for raising teenagers. And, you know, those kind of pre-digested how-to sermons, what's wrong with what God said? Well, it's good, but I don't think it's adequate. It's not enough. It's not sufficient for everything. Oh, wait a minute. Um, we need to be careful. Do we really practice what we say we believe? Come back to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. We have delightful words. They're words of truth correctly written down. And uh, here's how they work. I mean, it's the Word of God. God knows. He's the Creator. Remember verse 1 of chapter 12? Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. He knows what we need. He provides it. Uh, verse 11. The words of wise men. These are the wise words that we've been reading. The delightful words. The words of truth correctly written. The words of wise men are like goads and masters of collections. These collections are like well-driven nails. Two things about the words of wisdom that we have in Ecclesiastes and in God's Word. 
Number one, they're like goads. Now, that could be unpleasant. You know, the goad, and they know from all they've found about the, the ancient Near East, the long wooden poles with a metal prod on the end. And, you know, they used it to stick the oxen, poke them when they start off the path, when they're not going the right direction, when they need to get moving, these kind of things. So the negative things, you know what God's word to do is? Is to be like a goad. Sometimes you need to be pricked with it. And you need to feel that jab because you're not listening. You're not following what he said. You're drifting off the path. These words of wisdom, that's why we come to the word of God. Sometimes it seems like life's getting confusion, confusing. That is day. Sometimes I just want to go in. I close my door. And I think I'm going to read the word. Lord, things are not out of your control. I need to get my sight readjusted. You know, sort of like you go to the doctor periodically and you get your, talking about age, some of you just tune out for a minute. But you know, your eyes don't see as well. Well, you look better. But, yeah. It's like looking in the mirror, you know. You put your glass, you get in in the morning, you think, oh, oh, the wrinkles are all gone. <laughs> then you put your glasses on. Oh, I've added 400. <laughs> You know, but you go get your eyes readjusted, and they say, well, you know, you need an adjustment. And to make the adjustment, you say, oh, I can see clearer now. I can read a little better. Sometimes we need to be doing that constantly with the Word, because, you know, the world is constantly pushing in. The flesh is constantly pushing us this way. The devil's constantly. And, you know, we get out here, and all of a sudden, we bring confusion to our life. These are words of wisdom. They're like goats. You say, wait, wait, my thinking's off here. I've gotten off the track. This, that's why God gives his word. There's the negative side. It's to stick you. I tell people, don't, don't run from the word. Oh, well, I don't like what I heard. Well, decide. If it wasn't biblical, you shouldn't like it. But if it's biblical, then it was just unpleasant because it brought a sense of guilt. Fix it. You know, that's the goad. Then the other side, masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. And, you know, what that would be, it could be a tent peg that anchored the tent. It could be something anchored to the wall that gave secure thing to hang thing. But the point is, the Word of God gives us stability, firmness. Um, so this is what the words of wisdom do. They prod us if we're not doing what we should do. And they help anchor our life as we uh, listen to them. So the two things gone, uh, accomplished by these. This is sort of like the New Testament talks about Ephesians 4. Where what? To be taught the word and take the word in. Why? So we're not driven about by every wind of doctrine and trickery of men and things like that. No, nothing changed. It's always been the purpose of God's word to anchor us. And to prod us when we're not. That's why if churches move away from teaching the word, they're no longer getting prodded. Then they don't know when they're getting off track. And they lose their stability. That happens to individuals. It happens to churches. It's, as we would say, not rocket science. But the wisdom of God tells us, and this is what the word of God does. And you would expect it because note that last statement of verse 11. They are given by one shepherd. You know where these words of wisdom came from? They came from God. He's the God of truth. He's the God who cannot lie. There's only one ultimate author of Scripture. Sometimes you hear the talk about the dual authorship of Scripture. But there's only one ultimate author. That's God. Now, for example, in Ecclesiastes, he used Solomon. And in his uh, supernatural way, the Spirit of God, as 1 Peter chapter 1 tells us, moved on Solomon to write what God wanted written. But he used Solomon's personality and mind so that you see the different characteristics of the different writers of Scripture there. 
And yet the very words that they chose to use were the words that God directed. They're given by one shepherd. We better pay attention. He's not only the creator, he's the shepherd. He's the one watching over us. He's the one looking out for us. Uh, Psalm 23, we all know, the Lord is my shepherd. And I won't be afraid. I won't fear, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Sounds similar to Solomon. In fact, Psalm 1 is sometimes classified as a wisdom psalm because of similar kinds of language. He is our shepherd. And he's given words of wisdom for guidance in our life. Where else would we want to go? I'll tell you, I created you. And I'm the one shepherding you and watching over you. Here are my instructions. Verse 12. Second thing he's coming. First, those first three verses. This is God's word. It's God's wisdom. It comes from him. It's true wisdom. The world doesn't have it. That's why we've emphasized the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. The world, I don't care how smart and intelligent they are, they don't have the true wisdom of life and salvation and living in a manner pleasing to God that can only come from him. Now he's going to tell us, <coughs> excuse me, in these last three verses that we better do it because you're going to give an account for everything you do in every day of your life. This is serious business. God's not giving recommendations. In fact, he moves to imperatives here, giving commands. This serious business. Well, well, you know, nobody's perfect. And, you know, today, every day is important because every day will be one we give an account for. Verse 12, beyond this, my son. Only time he uses that expression, my son, here, it's used often in Proverbs. Uh, instructions given like to his son. Be warned. The writing of many books is endless and excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. Uh, what he's concerned about here is our use of books. And Solomon has made clear, even with all your wisdom, come back to chapter 8, verse 17. Verse 16, he says... I gave my heart to know wisdom, to see the task which has been done on the earth, even though one would never sleep, day or night, 24 hours a day, you're applying yourself with wisdom to sort out everything. And I saw every work of God. I concluded that man cannot discover the work which has been done under the sun. Even though man should seek laboriously, he will not discover. Though the wise man should say, I know, he cannot discover. In other words, even our life under the sun, you can't exhaust the knowledge of it in this world. Let alone now we get out here into the realm where God dwells and the angelic realm and the spirit world. We always delight in wanting to know more than we can know. Everything we need to know is here. And it guides us in our life here. So you can't exhaust it. So when you come to... Uh, Chapter 12, verse 12, he talks about don't weary yourself. He's already talked about the importance of the word of God. But beyond that, be careful. You know, part of what corrupts the church and seminaries and Bible schools is the desire to be knowledgeable in so many ways and in so many areas. I realize there are things we have to know in the world and God appoints for us to work certain jobs. You have to learn about that. You don't learn how to be a heart surgeon in the Bible, for example, of course, and so many other things. But we understand certain things are of prime importance. And I don't want to fill my life with everything else. So just be careful. It's not saying you can't have books and you can't read. But remember, don't think the world is driven. We've got to solve this problem. We've got to get the answers for this. The Bible is concerned about, first and foremost, is the relationship with God. And we know how we live our lives each day pleasing to him. Um, so Solomon was wise in a lot of areas, we're told 
and other places in Scripture about Solomon back in 1 Kings that they came to hear, and he would lecture on plants. He would lecture on trees. He knew a lot about a lot of things. But be careful what he's saying because you can exhaust yourself and accomplish nothing. So the conclusion, and he's going to give us a concise summary. You want to know what God says about your life? The conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments. And this applies to every person. Because if you don't listen to this, you're going to an eternal hell. Now, he doesn't get into that. He's primarily concerned you can't really understand life in any real meaningful way. I mean, look around. Look at the leaders of a country. Look at the smart scientists. They don't have a clue. Because they're not interested in what God says. I read a blurb in the news today, early this morning. And talking about billionaires. And the one billionaire nearing the end of his life just says, I'm an agnostic. I'm not interested in being a fool. He's like the rich man who's made a lot of, accomplished a lot of things, made a lot of preparations. And Jesus said, you fool. Tonight your soul will be required of you. I mean, he's not taking God into account. So fear God. That's recognize who he is. Come to bow before him. Acknowledge your sin and guilt. Claim the salvation he's provided in Christ. And uh, believe in him. And then keep his commandments. Don't reverse this. Trying to keep his commandments doesn't do anything. You can't. First you fear God. Then you obey him. Keep his commandments. Danger, and I mentioned this, young people growing up in a church like this in a Christian home, and you conform because your parents required is what the church expects. And so, you know, we try to live the kind of life that's required. Um, Somewhere along the line, you're going to have to come to face to face with God and who you really are. You're a sinner on your way to an eternal hell who's trying to live a life that seems like what God would want, but he wants the heart. And until he takes control of the heart, cleansing it, forgiving, and making new, you can't do anything to please him. Uh, There's none that does good, not even one. That's the condition apart from God. So you fear God, keep his commandment. This applies to everyone. And another reason. For God will bring, note this, every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. You know, we as believers sometimes slip. I'm going to heaven. I've trusted Christ. That's settled. You know, I can just go on now. You understand, everything in every day is something I'll give an account for. It's true for everybody. And I think, wow, everything, that's what he says, he'll bring every act to judgment. Everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. Uh, We fear God, we keep his commandments, we know we will give an account. He's the creator, he's the shepherd, he's the judge. Um, That makes every day important. This might seem like a nothing of a day. What you got going on today? Nothing. Um, Well, you do. Because you know, this is a day we'll give an account for. Not even, oh, well, I shouldn't be doing anything that's too much fun because I got to keep in mind judgment. Well, God told me to uh, rejoice and enjoy the day. Are you rejoicing? Are you enjoying the day? Well, no. Why would you not do that? God says he's going to call you into account. He told you what to do. Remember chapter 12, verse 1? Remember your creator in the days of your youth. What did he just tell us in chapter 11, verse 9? Rejoice during your childhood. (laughs) Let your heart be pleasant. Excuse me. I mean, I want to do what God says. Be wise. He'll call everything into judgment. 
I'm going to read a few verses for you, with you, and then we'll, uh, we'll be done with Ecclesiastes. Uh, keep his commandments. That's consistent instruction. We won't go back, but Deuteronomy filled with that. I'll go to one verse in Deuteronomy. Chapter 13, verse 4. Numbers 13. Um, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, thank you. Deuteronomy 13. And a warning. Don't listen to others. Don't listen to false teachers. That would fit about, be careful about use of books. We want first wisdom from God. Too many believers have gotten out into schools and seminaries and colleges and they listen to false teaching and then they get if a prophet or dreamer comes so you don't listen and you know why God allows these false teachings and error to come the middle of verse 3 for the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul <coughs> excuse me same thing Paul told the Corinthians. He said to the church at Corinth, there must be divisions among you. You know why? So that those who, and the word is dokomazo, those who pass the test become evident. Because those who depart from the truth in these divisions fail the test. That's the same thing he told in Deuteronomy. The Bible is consistent. You shall follow the Lord your God and fear him. There's a word. Fear him. And you shall keep his commandments. Listen to his voice. Serve him. Cling to him. Israel didn't do it. And we look at it and say, why? What's wrong with them? And here we carry around the word of God. Things come up. We're just like Israel. It's like we never learned anything. It's never we were hurt. Well, well. I, I still feel this way. Nobody cares how you feel. It's what God says. Now, if you need prodded with the goad, take it. But the, the solution is not to get off track. It's to get back on track. It's a test. Uh, and I have to show I love him. More than I love life, more than I love my closest friend, more than I love my family. Um, I want to pass the test. These tests come up in our days, and we blow by it and think nothing of whether we passed or failed the test. And when the pressure comes, that's to drive us to the Word. What does it say? Jesus said, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And those who don't love me don't keep my commandments. It's a dividing line. And we will, give a judge, we will give an account on the day of judgment. Come to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Look at verse 36. Jesus is talking. And he's talking about the condition of the heart. This is the problem. Uh, verse 13 said, make the tree good and its fruit good. Make the tree bad and its fruit bad. Don't be saying that you got the bad fruit hanging here, but I'm a good tree. And if you have a heart that's been changed by God, then you ought to be producing the character of God in your life. And if you're trying to produce that without the heart, you're going to be a frustrated, unhappy, miserable person. And, uh, we will be judged by our words because the end of verse 34 says, for the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. You see, the heart is the issue. You're bringing out of your heart. So your words and your actions are a revelation of your heart. That's why you have to begin with the fear of the Lord, placing your faith in Him and the salvation He provides so you can get a changed heart, a new heart. Verse 37, For by your words you will be justified, by your words you will be condemned. Well, you know, you say a lot of words in one day. But they're all being stored up and will be accountable. Every day is not only important. Every word in every day is important. We throw out words carelessly. And yet, the New Testament book of wisdom, James, tells us you better guard the tongue. 
It's the hardest thing to control. But we'll listen to things you shouldn't listen to. We'll say things that shouldn't be said. And then, well, nobody's perfect. And God said, you shall be holy for I am holy. And that won't cover it. Think we're going to stand before God. He's the judge and he's going to bring it up. And I'm going to say, well, you know, Lord, nobody's perfect. I don't think so. Um, I didn't even try that with my human father, let alone the heavenly father who's the judge of all men. Um, come to another passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul writing to the church at Corinth, and he's reminding them there can be no other foundation for a life laid, no other foundation for the church but Jesus Christ. And now we're building on the foundation as we've come to trust Christ. And the church is being built on that foundation of faith in Jesus Christ, the fear of God. And the end of verse 10 says, each man must be careful how he builds on this foundation which is the only foundation, Christ. No, no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work, we're bound to each individual, will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire. The fire will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work which he has built remain, on it remains, he will receive a ward. If it's burned up, he'll suffer, but he'll be saved if he's built on the foundation of Christ. You can have a, a relatively wasted, do-nothing life, even as a believer. We'll say, it won't matter. As long as I'm going to heaven, I'm good. It'll matter on that day. You know, there's nobody going to be saying, well, you know, I don't really care about this, Lord. Uh, I don't care whether you make me the lowest person uh, or the highest person, or what rewards I get. I'm not interested. What if, yeah, there's not going to be anybody there because those kind of people are going to be in hell. Because those people that don't care about what God has to say, what God's will is, are not God's children. I mean, you don't fear the Lord and talk back. You don't fear the Lord and tell him. He's telling us it will matter. It makes a difference. Um, and then he gives a warning in verses 16 and 17 that the church is God's temple and anybody who destroys God's temple are, is going to be destroyed by God. So the person who attacks and destroys the church is an unbeliever. This is going on at Corinth. He's got to tell them there's division, there's conflict, uh, there's the Paul faction, the Peter, you know, we got to get here. You may have to sort out, are you a believer not functioning as you should? You better get functioning right or you'll lose the reward that will be so important. But if in your working, you destroy the church, you just revealed a heart that doesn't belong to God. There's no middle ground. So these judgments we're saying, we're the same place as uh, Solomon was with Ecclesiastes. Fear God, keep his commandments, prepare for coming judgment. That's the same thing Paul said. It's the same thing Jesus said. Uh, one more passage. Come to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He's talking here. Sounds like Solomon. The end of verse chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying. Sounds like the first eight verses of uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the outer man was decaying. The arms and legs aren't functioning right. The ears don't hear. The walk has become a shuffle. Um, the outer man is decaying. That's quite Solomon saying the same thing consistent through Scripture. Same thing Paul says 2,000 years later. That's true for us 3,000 years after Solomon. A thousand years after Paul, our outer man is decaying. The inner man is being renewed. So Paul gives a fuller picture with additional revelation than Solomon gave, but same basic truths. Fear God, obey him, prepare for judgment. Um, 
Our earthly tent, chapter 5 opens up, may be folded up. That's death. The body's going to the grave, dust to dust. But we have it. Paul focuses more on what's going to happen after death. Solomon was just limited here. But the same things he said are important. Um, down in verse 6. Therefore, always being of good courage, knowing while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. We walk by faith, not by sight. We're of a good courage. We'd rather be with the Lord. True. Therefore, we have, verse 9, as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. Same thing Solomon was saying. Fear God. Obey him. Prepare for judgment. We want to please God. So when you walk with wisdom, you are walking in accord with the will of God. Through the sunshiny days, through the rainy days. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the, in the body. Note that. Same thing Solomon was focusing on. Fear God. Keep his commandments. Obey him. You'll give an account. We want to walk wisely. That this life is important. It's brief. It passes quickly. The days go by. We will give an account and be recompensed for what we've done with these days. I can't recoup. Most of my days are in the past. I can't say, oh, if I had that to do over, I would. Well, all I can do is, Lord, this is the day you've made for me. I want to function with your wisdom, which will be a life and a day that honors you with my obedience. I can't go back to yesterday. No sense in sitting in a puddle saying I've wasted my life or I should have done this. Yes, I should have. That's sin. I recognize, Lord, my yesterdays have failed in many ways. But today is today. That's just an excuse not to do today and live today the way I should. No wonder Christians get depressed and discouraged. I can't. Yesterday's gone. Even the world sings about that. It's true. We can't go back. We're going to be recommended for the deeds done in the body. That's his physical life. They say, oh, all Solomon was interested in was the physical life. Well, Paul was interested in that too. It's not all that's in the Scripture, but it's all God gave Solomon to write about in any detail on that occasion. Whether good or bad. Now, how that all will work out. Because we're going to be presented holy, blameless, and without spot. You know, I only know what God has revealed to this point. He tells me I will be accepted in his presence because of the work of Christ. He also tells me I will be accountable for every word and every deed done on every day. And that is a fearful thing. Look at verse 11, first line. Therefore... Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. You see? Well, that's what Solomon was talking about. Yeah, because the scripture is clear. You know, we fear God. We obey him. We want to live lives pleasing to him. If you love me, you will keep my word, Jesus said. And we prepare to face him. That's a fearful thing. There's uncertainty. But I'm confident because of the one who is my Savior. But I'm not cocky in thinking it won't make much difference what I did with today. I don't know how that will all work out. I know the ultimate end. I know the glory that God has promised. But today's important, and what I do with today is important. So the question, first, have you entered into the fear of the Lord? I don't know if you grew up in this church, if you have Christian parents, or this is your first Sunday here. It doesn't matter. Have you ever come to recognize your own personal sin and guilt? You know how individual these judgments are? Each one, each one, each one. You will individually stand, be evaluated before God. You have to get your heart right with him. Or you don't have a beginning. He'll cleanse the heart. He'll make you new. 
Now you can walk in wisdom with the enabling power he gives. And for those of us who have, we have all the more motivation to walk wisely in accord with his will. And don't run when he prods you with his word. Don't ignore it. Because he's using his word to direct us back to where we should be for our good and his glory. And all of this knowing someday we'll give an account for these brief lives. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for the riches of your word. Thank you for the book of Ecclesiastes. Thank you for Solomon and the wisdom you gave him and his diligence to apply himself and carefully record the words as you directed him so that we could benefit from your wisdom in living life under the sun. Lord, may we take these truths to heart. May we not put them aside and forget about them. May we keep them as guides day by day. Bless the day before us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.